As a pilot, I've always been fascinated by the wartime exploits of Bomber Command. I've known some of the veterans, and I own and fly one of the airplanes that they trained in. The classic movie about an impossible mission which succeeds against all the odds. The Dambusters is one of my favorite films. This has to be one of the most iconic scenes in the history of war cinema. But I want to know whether the movie has distorted our view of the true history of the raid. What I'm hoping to find out is the truth behind one of the most famous war stories of them all. I'm going to retrace the route taken by 617 Squadron during its famous raid and rediscover some of the forgotten secrets of the Dambusters. I'll be hearing from the RAF's last survivor from the raid. His crew's efforts didn't feature in the film. And taking to the skies with a former RAF Harrier pilot and navigating for him. By my reckoning, we should be, we should be turning now, and I can't see the river. I'm going to override you. Please, time. please. Or at least trying. Your thought, resourcefulness, courage. He was the dashing wing commander who led the raid. But who was the real Guy Gibson? He was arrogant, gorgeous, an absolutely charming young man. London, the bright lights of Leicester Square receive an added glitter. The film created an upsurge in national pride in an era of post-war austerity. Like the raid itself, boosting beleaguered Britain's morale. Cheers and admiration greet the princess who wears for the premiere. And perhaps this is where the film and the legend of the Dambusters started to become one and the same. Fifty-five years after its release, the Dambusters retains its power as a piece of wartime storytelling. It stars Richard Todd as Wing Commander Guy Gibson and Michael Redgrave as Barnes Wallace, the inventor. In the movie, their double act personified the bravery and ingenuity that summed up perhaps the most spectacular and daring raid in the history of aviation warfare. Over the years, the movie has been accepted by many as the definitive version of the story, but a lot of it was pure fiction. Guy Gibson's trip to the theater did not throw up the ingenious twin lamp method for accurately measuring the height of the aircraft above the water. No, far less dramatically. It was a scientist at the Ministry of Aircraft Production who came up with the idea, which was crucial to the success of the operation. The written sources for the film were two books, Guy Gibson's Enemy Coast Ahead and Paul Brickhill's The Dambusters. Now, according to those who know, both are riddled with inaccuracies. And then, much of the information that director Michael Anderson required for strict historical accuracy was still classified as secret. Just take me through these timings again, and I'll write them down. If I'm to follow the route of 617 Squadron, I'll need to do my homework, especially as they expect me to navigate the route. Former RAF fighter pilot Chris Norton led one squadron into battle during the conflicts in the Gulf and Kosovo. He'll be my pilot, and I'm just beginning to understand what I'm letting myself in for. Wow, that's daunting. So they would probably have had some fairly significant blind areas going across... We'll be joined along the way by former RAF Red Arrows pilot Dave Slow in a second aircraft. Waterway. The whole thing is mind-boggling, and that they could navigate at night being shot at yeah. and not being able to see out either. That's probably an advantage, I suppose. I mean, you just rely on your, your stopwatch and your compass and 
and let the captain worry about the rest. Lights out, pressure's rising. RPM's good. Start warning lights out, automated warning lights out. It's time to get airborne. And later, I'll be following the training routine of 617 Squadron. This is RAF Scampton in Lincolnshire, home of the Dambusters. It's a very different place today. There are no longer combat aircraft based here, but you can almost feel the ghosts of the past. Spring 1943. Airmen specially selected from across Bomber Command were brought together here to form 617 Squadron under the tightest possible secrecy. We had no idea what the targets were going to be. And security was an absolute premium. All letters were censored. And even the, tele the public telephone outside the, the, the station was monitored. They trained for Mission Impossible not knowing their weapon or their target. Time and again, they honed their low-flying skills over British dams. For Johnny and the other young airmen, the unknown danger of their mission to come was on hold as their intensive training began. Flying at 100 feet, which was the prescribed height for our training, was great. Lying in the front, I'd see the ground just whizzing past. Low-level cross countries, all done by map reading because it wasn't feasible um, to use the navigation aids at that height. Decelerating 140, letting down. So what's it like to fly so low? We're about to find out. We're heading down to the height that 617 Squadron would have trained at, 100 feet from the ground. Just going to weave around these houses. Good idea. The legal minimum flying height for civilian aircraft is 500 feet, but we've got special permission from the Civil Aviation Authority. In 1943, this was the best way to stay alive if you were over enemy territory. Too low for night fighters and uh, radar. But of course it's very challenging flying this low, but this is in broad daylight. Imagine doing this at night. Oh. Are you comfy at 100 feet yet? Me? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's funny how quickly it happens, isn't it? Oh, yeah. This is exactly the sort of training they would have done. And the, the beauty of it is that they knew they really couldn't get in trouble, no matter what they did. But they went roaring over villages and whatever, um, learning to navigate. And uh, But, of course, this is the day. So you've got lots and lots of visual um, resolution. Whereas at night, you don't have any of that. And the way they simulated that is they put a blue film over the windscreen and then they wore yellow bubbles. You look at the amount of risk they carried in training, it's just amazing, really. As the navigator, flying at this height is difficult for me. Instead of the panoramic view you get at a thousand feet, down here you see very little and you reach the horizon in seconds. So navigation is challenging. Luckily, Chris is alongside me. So we've got a guy here coming up in the, on the nose. And then we're going to come back down there. Right. This is where 617 Squadron prepared for the raid. The twin towers of the Derwent Dam in the Derbyshire Peak District. Fortunately for us, the weather's lovely. So uh, we're going to be in the hills of the Peak District, uh, practicing getting into the very difficult terrain that they had to contend with when they were in the, the rural hills. Well, what uh, Gibson did is he spent a long time pouring over maps trying to find as many features as he could in the UK that he could mimic that would happen on the raid. And then he got the guys flying around those features again and again and again until they could find them in their sleep. They learnt all the, the mistakes of navigation or the, the tricks of navigation that they were going to use later. Chris knows this valley well. He once flew down it in a Harrier jump jet at night at 400 miles an hour, but he's never been down it this low. This was the Dunbuster's other secret weapon. This is an exact replica 
of the bombsite that they used on the raid, if you believe the film, that is. But this man knows the real story better than anyone else alive. Johnny Johnson occupied the bomb aimers position in the Lancaster, piloted by the American Joe McCarthy. We had to make our own bomb sites, and they consisted basically of a, a plywood of a triangle with pins in the three points. I didn't use one at all. I had no need to use one on the actual attack. And that's because Johnny's crew was dispatched to attack the Zorpa Dam, a very different structure to the Ada and the Myrna. We wonder what the hell was it all about. How were we going to do it? We didn't know until we got there. Uh, the Zorpa had no towers, and it was almost impossible to approach for a head-on attack because of the hills round about it. And so the practice was going to have to be coming down over the hills on one side, flying across the dam, and releasing the bomb as near as you could to the center of the dam. We weren't spinning it. It was going to be an, an inert drop. So it was up to me as the bomb hanger to estimate when was the right time to drop it. We weren't very happy about that, but there we are. That was, we had to get on with it. On the 10th attempt, he released the weapon, hitting the target, one of only two crews to do so. But despite causing serious damage, the waters were held back, although urgent repairs were needed. Well, could it really have worked? We're about to find out. Back at the Derwent, it's time for our own experiment. Holding the site steady is extremely hard. Almost impossible. Got towers? Oh, yes, yeah, shake this. OK. Get your wings level as soon as parts will be. The site is a nightmare to hold steady. OK. Coming in, coming, coming, coming. Coming, coming, coming. Coming, bombs gone. No! I think we, I think we got it that time. So it's very fast and furious right at the end, isn't it? Yeah. We're all full of admiration for the men who first did this. I still can't believe they managed to get a Lancaster in there. I know. This is probably nimble compared to a fully laden Lancaster. Ah, uh, absolutely. Because the wooden site proved hard to use, the bomb aimers improvised with surprising results. And believe it or not, this was one device, a length of string. Again, the two forward points were used to measure the drop distance when lined up with the twin towers of the dam. OK, wings level soon. Yep. Steady, steady. Steady, combine, combine, combine. Level, level. Steady. Get it, get it level, get it level, get it level. <laughs> OK. OK. All right, hold it, hold it. Level up, level up, level up. The bomb got good effort. Yeah. That's miles away, isn't it? Um, that was phenomenal. I love that. That was good. Um, I got a good sight of the headland on the left that time. But you could see how absolutely crucial it was to get the wings level. No point in letting the bomb go when you've got any bank on, otherwise it's going off to the side. I prefer the string. I now feel I know a bit more about the problems of dropping a bouncing bomb. But what exactly was it? A bouncing bomb that'll skip across the surface of the water and explode against the dam wall. Codenamed Upkeep, this ingenious device was only ever used on this one raid. The secret to its operation was applying backspin through a belt mechanism before release. It made the revolving depth charge skip across the surface of the water before hitting the dam wall and exploding at a set depth to cause maximum damage. In the movie, the bomb is the wrong shape and size because its real dimensions were classified as secret until 1973. Dr. Barnes Wallace, the inventor of the special dam-busting bomb, and Air Marshal Sir Robert Saunby and Lady Saunby. But after the premiere, the retired Air Marshal complained of a, a fundamental misconception in the film. Wallace, he complained in a letter to the New Statesman, was not behind the idea to attack the dams. 
Plans were being hatched to attack the German dams as early as 1937. And the idea of exploding a depth charge against the dams was being discussed before the outbreak of the war. I've got an idea for destroying the Ruhr dams. The effects on Germany would be enormous. I know all that. I've read the report. Do you really think you can knock down a dam with that thing? Yes. Well, it looks clever enough on paper. That goes for all these wheezy ideas. When you try to make them work, they fall down flat. This one doesn't. How do you know? We've tested it and proved it. I've got some films here that I would like you to see. Barnes Wallace is depicted as the genius inventor, frustrated by bureaucracy and the skepticism of the war office. That's not strictly true. The real Barnes Wallace did feel a huge burden of responsibility for the airmen who had to deliver his invention. One was endangering those men's lives simply to make an idea work. But mind you, the doing was done by Guy Gibson and 617 Squadron, not by me. What can't be disputed is the bravery of those young men who took to the skies. Their courage, audacity, and sacrifice is rightly celebrated in this movie. Two months after 617 Squadron was formed, their task was finally revealed. They'd fly at night, 60 feet above the water, at more than 200 miles an hour. Possibly under heavy fire, they'd drop their single untried weapon in an attempt to break the dam walls and destroy German armaments factories in the valleys below. Under the light of the full moon, seven young men climbed into each Lancaster. They'd all trained exhaustively, honing their individual skills, each of them depending on their fellow crew members for their survival. It's hard to imagine how they were feeling as they sat cramped in their cockpits waiting for takeoff. The 19 Lancasters left RAF Scampton in three waves. Flying low over the North Sea, they crossed the enemy coast and on deep into the Ruhr Valley. They pressed home their attack on three dams, breaching the Myrna and the Ada. But the air crews paid a terrible price for their bravery. Of 19 Lancasters, only 11 come home. My dad called it a suicide mission. So courage, absolute courage beyond any fear. John Fraser survived the wreckage of his crashed plane due to the heroism of his pilot, John Hopgood. They were badly hit and dad released the bomb. Hopgood tried to take the aircraft up approximately 300 feet so that the crew could bail. My dad managed to pull his, his chute out of the, and get, got caught in the slipstream and the chute opened and he, he bailed at very, very low altitude, extremely low. And he said the treetops looked awfully damn close. This memorial commemorates the airmen of 617 Squadron who lost their lives in World War II. More than a quarter of them fell on that first raid in May 1943. But on the German side, the consequences of that raid were catastrophic in human terms as well as industrial. Nearly 70 years on, these scenes of devastation could be seen as insensitive. Even triumphalist from today's perspective. So many innocent people were killed. 
But this was wartime. The next stop off on our journey is where it all began, RAF Scampton, home of the Dambusters. This was the officer's mess when 617 Squadron was based here. Oh, you know most of the chaps, I think. All right, carry on, please. Hello, sir. Hello, Dingy. McCarthy, sir. Oh, yes, In the movie, this is where Gibson meets the officers from his new squadron for the first time. And this is where that scene was shot. Just extraordinary. Even derelict. It's so atmospheric. And this is the officer's mess at Scampton. You can imagine it filled with rumbustious young men, not long out of school, probably even had mates killed last week, yesterday. And there would have been a fantastic amount of horseplay in here. I mean, they probably played cricket and rugby right here. And got drunk right here. And who can blame them? A short walk from the officer's mess at Scampton is another relic of the raid, steeped in the history of the squadron. I'm trying to put myself in Guy Gibson's shoes, as it were, the night before the raid, sitting in this office with that awesome responsibility on your shoulders. At the age of 24, it just it doesn't compute, you know. I get nervous sometimes if I'm just going off in my plane on my own. It's just that little tension, you know, about the being a pilot and just knowing where you're going and the things that could go wrong. Just imagining that with all of those lives, all of those crews, The Nazis, they have their German youth movement where they're taught the foulest things in life and you're quite the opposite. This was Guy Gibson addressing the Boy Scouts. He was patriotism personified. Barnes Wallace described him as all guts and go. But if you strip back the layers of Boy's own legend from the movie, a far more complex figure emerges. So who was the real Wing Commander Gibson? This most English of heroes was born in 1918 in India during the British Raj, only moving back to Britain when he was six years old. Gibson was basically insecure in that he had a very dysfunctional family at the age of six. His parents uh, split up. His mother became an alcoholic by the time he was 12, and she, he didn't have a family life in any sense. That meant that he was, I think throughout his life, an insecure person and somewhat lonely. There was nothing in his early life that gave clues to the wartime hero he would become. At the school, he was uh, sound but unspectacular. He was Lance Corporal in the OTC, um, and he didn't shine in sport. So he was not, therefore, in any sense, an outstanding personality. His one love was flying. And from 1935, he got it into his mind he actually wanted to fly. And that gave him a sense of purpose. He had in his room there a collection of Biggles books. And on the wall was a photograph of Albert Ball, the VC of the First World War. And I think that may well be his inspiration wanted to fly. When he goes into the service in 1936, he then has to acquire a military personality. And that's where I think you have a difference between what he was as a person and what he was as a, an officer in the RAF. I was a sergeant then, and one of his, I suppose, shortcomings, if that's the right word, was the, he couldn't mix with the lower ranks too well. He was a strict disciplinarian. The other thing about him was that he was quite small, quite short. 
And one got, got the impression that short men were more for arrogance than they were for anything else. And I remember on one occasion, on an evening meeting, Gibson, really tall, a, a, a young Canadian part of us to pieces because he'd run his girlfriend in Lincoln the night before and said, sorry, he couldn't make it, we'd got something on. That was all he said, but as far as Gibson was concerned, that was a breach of security. And so we knew exactly what the position was. He was not a natural leader. He was a, a manufactured leader in the sense that he adopted an attitude which he felt was the way of, get, of running something in much the same way as a school was run. Many years later, one of the rear gunners on 617 Squadron said he was a product of his environment. And by that he meant that he had come from a public school, which was a hierarchical organization, where the prefects controlled the, the boys. And he applied this to the RAF. He made sure that the lower ranks saluted him because he felt that that was part of discipline. Without saluting, and without smart uniforms, you didn't have efficiency. He is not only insecure and lonely, but is rather gauche socially. <laughs> Gibson as the commander was much more of a martinet, much more a disciplinarian than he appeared in the film. <laughs> I've saved my life, never forget it. He appeared as sort of a jovial, almost jovial uh, person. What are you messing about for? I told you, I'm not going. Skipper, this, uh, this new squadron, you going to fly with it? Well, of course I'm going to fly with it. Well, you'll need a crew, won't you? Well, of course, but there's nothing in that. I'll get one, all right. Oh, you mean you've had enough of us? You want to get rid of us? I didn't say that. Gibson's crew from his old squadron eagerly signed up to join him. But that's not the way it happened. In fact, only one member of his old crew joined him at 617 Squadron, Flight Lieutenant Hutchison, his wireless operator. Whilst on leave, he met actress and showgirl Eve Moore, who was older than him, at a party in Coventry. And they were married the next year in 1940. In her words, she, he stalked her. He used to go to uh, all her plays, and the other cast said, there's that RAF boy sitting in the front row. My husband's efforts and all the boys in the services with him can bring this war to an end so quickly, so much the better, and then we can enjoy ourselves. But hundreds of miles away in Lincolnshire, her husband was shouldering the immense burden of leadership alone. He befriended a member of the Women's Auxiliary Air Force, Margaret Masters. When I first met Guy, I'd gone out to help either operate on or bring in a very badly injured officer. After kneeling on the floor for some time and holding what was left of a badly injured arm. My knees rather hurt. It was a very hard floor. And I looked at a pair of legs behind me and said, can I borrow your legs to lean against? I didn't know it at the time that, that they were Guy's legs. That's how I first met him. My first impressions were that he was a typical officer, full of his own importance at times. But there was something about him that I wanted to know more and more. And I did. He was charming. I found that he was at a bad spot. In fact, his marriage was broken. And he was lonely, unhappy, but he loved his job. Everything was flying. This is the first time Margaret has spoken publicly about their relationship. She recalls a fantasy world they escaped to. In it, they shared a life together in a place they called Honeysuckle Cottage. Each meeting was adding a little bit to the cottage. I could tell you how many teaspoons we had. We did it that much. It was a, just a form of escapism from the life we were leading, which on one hand was very, very dangerous, 
and on my behalf it was very, very painful at times. We used to drive out and sit and just chat, just generally, and found out about each other's lives. Do you think he was in love with you? I hope he was. Yes, I was. I'd be a fool if I wasn't. <laughs> Wing Commander Gibson VC, who led the Great Lancaster Raid on the Ruhr Dams, Immediately after the dam's raid, Guy Gibson inevitably became a national hero, receiving a Victoria Cross for his leadership. His bravery was extraordinary. After dropping the first bomb, he flew in a further three times with the attacking bombers to draw the fierce enemy fire away from them. Guy Gibson died in a plane crash over Holland the following year. The Petwood Hall Hotel in Woodhall Spa. It's where the 617 Squadron officers' mess was eventually based. Chris Norton and I are staying here tonight before embarking on our flight to Germany. Inside, there's a bar dedicated to the memory of the squadron and its defining moment. Chris knows the feeling of going into battle and was himself awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross, one of Gibson's many wartime honours. You've been to war yourself and had to presumably lie awake at night or, or at least know that tomorrow morning is the day I'm going to go into action. What's that like? <laughs> um, the first time you go into action, everybody's anxious. I should imagine. Um, they're mostly anxious about not making a mistake. Um, I think they're less anxious, albeit that there's still an anxiety there, mm. uh, that they might not come back. Mm. Um, now. There, it was probably more certain in 1943 than it is today that you're not going to come back. The chances of not coming back were quite high. In the case of the Iraq war, which is when I was commanding uh, one squadron, mm -hmm. then there were a lot of people who didn't believe in that war. I, I guess in the, in the Second World War, the issues were, were much clearer. Oh, I think I mean, it, was it, was, a, it, was, it was... Exactly, it was a war of national survival. Yes, absolutely. Um, and um, the whole country was at war whether you were a labourer or a driver or a wife, a nurse, mm -hmm. a, a pilot or a soldier, mm -hmm. um, everyone was at war. In about 10 hours time, we'll be setting off to follow Guy Gibson's route. I wonder how well he slept the night before the raid. Martin. Good morning. How are you? You all right? Yes, thank you. Good to go? The time has come to retrace the route taken by 617 Squadron. But first, an impromptu navigation briefing. Absolutely. Briefing on the wing? Always the best way. And I must admit, to some last-minute nerves, I'm about to navigate the longest flight I've ever undertaken in a light aircraft across some of Europe's busiest skies. Oh, well, here goes. Take off. We'll be in close formation with a second plane that will follow us as far as the coast. This is the start of a 400-mile flight that in 1943 changed the course of the war. When the dambusters left Scampton, there was no tarmac. Their runway was made of grass. But some things haven't changed. As the crews headed for enemy airspace, each must have wondered whether they would ever see a familiar landmark like Lincoln Cathedral again. It's extraordinary to think that that's pretty much what they saw. You put yourself in their, in their position, you know, and not, not much has changed, really. Essentially, you're looking out of a, the window of an aeroplane at the cathedral. There were so many bomb command bases around yeah. Lincolnshire. And uh, whilst they, uh, they will have been in small villages and small pubs, then uh, Lincoln was, was that big landmark. So onwards over the familiar towns and villages and across the vast expanse of the Lincolnshire Fens. So who were the men who set out for Germany on that day in May in 1943? The movie suggests that they were veterans, handpicked by Guy Gibson himself. But that wasn't the whole story. Some were there quite by chance. Jack Liddell was the youngest dambuster, 
but he'd already been thrown out of the RAF. He was just 15 at the outbreak of war. But that wasn't about to stop him joining up, even if he had to lie about his age. He joined underage, and when the authorities found out his real age, they threw him out. So he went to the London Fire Service and worked with them during the Blitz. Working for the London Fire Service in the Blitz was as dangerous as anything. I mean, a lot of firemen were killed. So he did join eventually again and um, got trained up as a gunner. Vic Townsend served with Jack Liddell on the same bomber crew. He now lives near Sydney, Australia. These postcards are mementos of their Lancaster bombing raids whilst serving together on 61 Squadron. This is the view young Jack would have had from his position as rear gunner. I met Jack Liddell in 1942, after we'd come back from Canada and been pushed into a number of time-wasting activities just because it was a bottleneck in training. And I never knew him as Jack Liddell. He was always called Killer because he never fired his guns in anger. They said to all of us, you can do a period of instruction or you can join this new squadron which we are just forming, but we cannot tell you anything about it. Nobody volunteered, nobody wanted to volunteer blind, but uh, Jack Liddell said, I can't instruct nobody. I can fire a gun. I'll go to the new squadron. So that's how he got to the Dambuster squadron. So he went on the Dambusters raid and didn't come back. And that's because the Lancaster that Jack Liddell was aboard, piloted by Robert Barlow, crashed over Germany, killing all of its crew. But more of that story in a moment. Leaving the English coast, we drop as low as the Lancasters of 617 Squadron would have done to avoid enemy detection. 4570 for Amsterdam, Golf Yankee Mike. For the last 45 minutes, we've been flying east over the North Sea. Back then, it was a dangerous place, bristling with enemy ships, a fact that the crews of 617 Squadron were well aware of. It was an operation certain death, but it was operation quite likely to, quite likely, quite yeah. likely to die. Yeah. We're going to come back onto the track at Topper, which is this point here. Right. So I'll, I'll hit that point there for you. Okay. And then, then you've got it, so you'll know where you are, where you stand. Hundred feet. There you go. Cracking. The Dutch aviation authorities have given us special permission to cross the coast at a height of a hundred feet. They will have gone as low as they dared, and I think some of the pilots were extremely low. Um, Thirty feet. They were reputed to be able to fly at. Well, this looks a lot less than 100 feet to me. You're the expert, but I reckon that's a lot less than 100 feet. I reckon that's how less. Well, I've got 100 feet on the altimeter. So, even in daylight, with no enemy menace to threaten us, low flying is difficult. That's the Dutch coast ahead, and in 1943, we'd be flying into a lethal hell of anti-aircraft fire. So, your best chance was to stay low. But that had its dangers too. As pilot officer Jeff Rice, flying in the second wave of Lancasters, found to his cost. He was so low that he had to hop over the sand dunes. He couldn't judge the, um, the distance above the water because of the moon. And then the last thing you'll see is will be a shadow coming up to meet you. And it's yours. And it's yours. Yeah, yeah. There's an enormous bang, followed by a second bang. His engineer said to him, you've lost the bomb. And he then had to pull the aircraft up. But of course, the water was so violent that it not only went down through the fuselage, but it hit the top of the fuselage in the cockpit where he, where he was. Incredibly, Jeff Rice managed to pull the bomber out of the water in what surely must be one of the greatest escapes of the war. And he headed for home, his mission over. With the tailwheel disabled by the impact, the landing back at Scampton was dangerous left the rear gunner, Sergeant Burns, trapped in his turret. So poor old Burns has to be cut out of the rear turret by the ground crew. The day after the raid, the surviving pilots were photographed together. Gibson quizzed Rice as to why he'd lost the bomb. He told him, and he looked at him, and he said, bad luck, I almost did the same thing. You want to come a bit 
you're you're right of track at the moment. Very good. One four three is that right? Yes. So that's exactly what they did. What they did is say, if you if I'd got you right of track but not flying properly, you just said right. Come left ten. Yep. For about a minute yep. and then turn me back onto my heading. So, okay. So well, that's what you want to do. Okay. We're crossing the Zyder Zee, Holland's inland sea. And following the Dambusters' wake seems simple. Flying in broad daylight, that is. The only thing you wouldn't want to do in here is you wouldn't want to fly past a flagship. We are absolutely beautifully on track. We've got perfect visibility and nobody's shooting at us. Drifting off the route plan cost more than one Lancaster the lives of its crew. For them flying at 100 feet or less at night, it was understandable. But even in the day, navigation isn't simple. As I'm finding out. Now I think I'm slightly right of track. I've got you bang on. Yeah, okay. Well, by my reckoning, we should be we should be turning now, and I can't see the river. I think we missed it. I think it was back there. I don't. I don't think so. I think that the river is coming up on our right hand side. Okay. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna override you. Please, this time. please. Okay. Yeah. But just if you, uh, if you just think about the emotion that's going on as you start thinking, Definitely. I haven't seen my point. I haven't seen my point. I'm starting yeah. to get worried. Yeah, and my, my point's late. He's right, of course. But in the industrial sprawl of southern Holland, it's easy to make a mistake. In 1943, it could have been a fatal error. It's the confusion, isn't it? Yeah. If you get, you get, you, know, you see something go past, and you think, right, that's me and then you're getting doubt in your own mind, yes. more and more doubt in your own mind. Crossing the border and uh, going to Langen information. Bye bye. Go off, Yankee Mike. We've just crossed the German border, and in 1943, these were very dangerous skies, as Flight Lieutenant Robin Barlow and the crew of e Easy were just about to find out. It's thought a combination of enemy fire and pylons conspired to bring down the Lancaster, with the loss of all seven crew near to Halden in northern Germany. But when the embers cooled from the crash site, the Germans were able to recover the top secret weapon intact. They knew that the Germans had recovered one of the bombs and they were afraid that they would be able to adapt it and use it. Weapons experts quickly went to work analyzing the bomb. These technical diagrams show how full a picture they had of the weapon. And along with the bomb, they had one of the surviving members of the Lancaster that crashed in flames on the other side of the Myrna Dam, Flight Sergeant John Fraser. He was in a solitary confinement for, ten, for seven days and he was interrogated. He did describe some details uh, being forced to. I would say that he probably wasn't treated very well. German transcripts of his interrogation show how Fraser gave away top secret information, including details of his training and his own role as bomb aimer. He also divulged technical details of how the weapon was deployed. And this seldom seen top secret German footage shows just how far advanced their plans were to deploy a similar weapon against British targets. Codenamed Kurt, it was a rocket-assisted bouncing bomb. So the same dams used by 617 Squadron to train for the raid were now themselves under threat of attack. These German plans showed the fears were justified. Enemy reconnaissance had pinpointed the reservoirs which presented the maximum opportunity to damage the British war effort. A month after the dam's raid, Winston Churchill was so worried about a copycat raid by the Germans, he personally sought assurances from the war cabinet about the readiness of British defences. For the five dams close to Sheffield, we deployed a total of 5,000 troops. We put smoke screened balloons, anti-aircraft guns, and in some of the dams, we actually put a metal structure on each side of the dam with um, wires slung down between them so you couldn't have low-flying low aircraft attacking. It's bank holiday in Germany, and the crowds are out enjoying the sun. 
This is the Myrna Dam, now a place of leisure as well as an abiding memorial to a national disaster. It's hard to believe this mighty stone structure was ever breached. It's huge. It's big. There's a lot of water in it. From up here, it makes me shudder to think of that dam coming down. But when it did, the devastation wrought upon this beautiful place was total. Maria Nierhoff was 16 years old and living in the town of Neheim, about four miles from the dam. Our house stood here. Our neighbor, Herr Schacke, said to us, save yourselves, the Myrna has been breached. The water poured down the valley, destroying towns and villages for many miles. You heard this roaring sound, and as soon as we heard that roar of the water, we were lucky we could run straight up the hill. We just ran and ran. Now time changes your perception of what's an enemy and what's good and what's bad. And really it was a political regime that was making this bad and not the people, nor the country. That being said, it's now against the Geneva Convention to bomb water. Really? Yeah, so uh, it's an illegal target. If we, if we were ever sent against such a thing, then uh, bombing a dam is completely illegal ever is since really? the Geneva Convention. Maria is retracing her footsteps. This journey of about two miles probably saved her life. We just kept running. When we arrived at the top of the hill, we stopped at the cross and sat down underneath it. There was one neighbor, they had four children. They must have been asleep and not woken up. I don't know. One man was home on leave and said to his wife, you go up the hill with the baby. And he went back to help this family with the four children. He died along with that family. They all died. It was just how it was. There were several people at the cross. They had run up the hill. It was a very clear night, so they could see everything. They came in their planes and they shot at us. Like I said, if I hadn't been there, I wouldn't have believed it. There were no men there, just women and children. It was just war. That's how it was. So many people died. We were lucky that we went up that hill, or we might have died as well. Today we arrive in peacetime, in the land of our close European allies. For us, it's a thrill. For them, it's a different thing, isn't it, altogether? It's, it's hard, really, to, to say what my thoughts are because there, there, there's so many conflicting thoughts. All these years later, Maria's memories are still vivid. Then in the morning, we came down. Everything was underwater. All the houses had gone. Our house was simply no longer there, not even the foundations. There was nothing left of it. All the houses had gone. We just couldn't believe it. Of the estimated 1,600 people who died, it's reckoned that more than 900 were foreign forced laborers. By comparison, the Ada Dam breach caused a fraction of the casualties. Four bombs hit the dam before the breach was confirmed. And then where I'm standing here, a tsunami was triggered this way and 135 billion liters of water, unimaginable amount, came cascading down the valley. Guy Gibson looked down and thought it was an absolutely wonderful sight. And of course to them it was. The raid was successful. They'd done their duty. They hadn't been killed on the way. They hadn't screwed up by missing the dam altogether. And yet down here, it must have been awful. And it's hard to equate the, the peacefulness and the calm, the nice afternoon in the sun. You know, people strolling backwards and forwards, sitting on benches, having picnics. And this was a scene of such utter 
terrible devastation. And for me, it's poignant as well, because I read about this raid when I was 15, and, and it's just something, if you're interested in aeroplanes and war stories, that is right in the center of your imagination, and here I am where it happened. And I can imagine and hear the Lancasters pulling up and getting out over there. And yet there's a sort of an overtone of sadness as well, you know, the futility of it all. In the end, it, it didn't really accomplish very much at all. And that sentiment strikes a chord in modern day Germany. Also, auf deutscher Seite, Opfer. So, on the German side, we see them as war victims. We see this event as a day of commemoration and also as a warning of the futility of war. And we hope that such events are never repeated. In England, it is remembered very differently. In some reports, the German casualties are forgotten about and the attack is seen in pure technical terms as a military operation against a target. When this squadron photograph was taken after the raid, 53 members of 617 squadron were already dead. Nearly 70 years on, and just a handful survive. One of the last two British Dambaster veterans has died at the age of 91 at his home in Lincolnshire. Flying officer Ray Greyston was a member of 617 squadron. His funeral will be held at Boston Crematorium. Ray Greyston was part of the crew that breached the Ada Dam. On a later raid, he was captured after escaping from his doomed Lancaster before it crashed, and he spent the rest of the war as a German prisoner. Obviously very sad in the passing of Ray. He was a great guy, uh, very modest, uh, wore the badge of hero reluctantly. The ingenuity, the, 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 the spirit of these young men who were just doing a job and did it really well uh, in such a short space of time should be remembered. Uh, what is what we are capable of being able to do when we're called upon. And I think that's very much lacking today. You know, I think we should remember that. And on the anniversary of the raid, they are still remembered. At this year's commemorative service, there was only one Dams Raid veteran attending, Johnny Johnson. My father was a pilot of AJT on the Dams Raid. I get to see uh, Johnny Johnson, my dad's bomb aimer, and there's, he's the last living uh, member in, in the UK that we know of. And there's only four of them in the world, so it's just really great to come back and see somebody that was in my dad's crew. And you look at what these uh, people did, left their jobs and their schools when they were 18, 19, 20 years old and went out to fight a war. And, and not knowing how long it was gonna take or if you'd ever come back. And then they came back and they sort of, after the war, it's like they dropped it and just went on with their lives. And, and it was uh, a part that was they all just sort of let lie and, and uh, you know, they, they don't brag or anything like that. And it's just uh, wonderful to, to honor those people. Not much was said when they returned from war. Not much at all. And they didn't talk, like my dad didn't talk much to my mom about it. And, and he certainly, as, as a little girl, I just remember my father loved flying and uh, I was a dam buster's daughter and he busted dams and I didn't know what the heck that was as a child. It was just funny. I thought it was funny and uh, and how now when I look back years later and I can reflect on what these men did. To go out on the night of a raid like that and to be talking about we might not come home and to fly and do that, I can't imagine the courage it took. This has been an amazing journey for me. I've learned so much about a story that I knew very well, and there was a lot more to learn. 
And now, I'm about to realize a boyhood ambition. Today's flight is all about marking perhaps the most important act of wartime defiance in this nation's history. This is the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight, Lancaster. One of only two left flying in the world. This is the, uh, the end of a memorable personal journey for me and the fulfillment of a a boyhood dream, really. <laughs> I can't believe I'm doing this. It's the 70th anniversary of the start of the Battle of Britain. Uh, today, this grand old lady is on ceremonial duty. We'll be giving a lot of pleasure to people on the ground, as well as memorializing some of the brave men who lost their lives flying in these wonderful things. What could evoke the British wartime spirit better than the White Cliffs of Dover and a Spitfire flying in close formation? On the ground, thousands have gathered, including some of the veterans themselves. All have come to see us fly past in honor of those who died defending this country. Seeing the, uh, the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight Spitfire uh, join us and then do an attacking run, it's a sight I never thought I would see in this life, believe me, but it was very exciting. Just when it seems it really cannot get any better, well, it just has. Squadron leader Stuart Reed has asked me to join him on the flight deck. If you said to them, best part of 70 years ago, we'll still have one flying in honor of what you did, they would never have believed it. Ceremonial duties performed, it's time to head for home. So what have I learned along the way? Well, the Dam Buster story and the men who made it possible. It's not like the movie at all. Oh no. In truth, it's far more unbelievable. A far more amazing story than that. your chance to make a call on that later. The Dam Busters is BBC Two's film tonight at 11.30. Next, Deborah Meaden's dragon dealings are uncovered.